Welcome everyone to another edition of Three Things Here presented by the TAI. My name is Emma Cooper. I am the outreach manager here at the TAI and I'm really excited for another informal chat with the smart folks uh, who are part of the TAI family. And uh, today we've got uh, David Beers who will be on kind of talking about the history of the TAI and how it intertwines with solutions journalism, uh, which will be a great chat. And uh, David, if you don't already know, uh, is, is a beloved figure at the Taiyi. He is our founder of uh, the whole shebang. Uh, the Taiyi was founded in 2003. Uh, I was graduating high school. David was out uh, founding this newspaper. And uh, prior to the Taiyi, he had worked in, uh, in media, is very passionate about it. He had worked for Mother Jones as an editor uh, and also at the Vancouver Sun as an initiatives editor there. Uh, and founded the Taiyi kind of out of um, looking for a different something different in the media landscape. So we're going to kind of talk about the evolution of that uh, and um, just about solutions journalism, about that sort of positive, forward-looking kind of journalism. So welcome to the uh, Zoom stage, please. It's David Beers. Yay. Let's, oh. Uh, Hi. Our tech is doing so good. We're immediately, <laughs> we were joking before that we are on the level of SNL in terms of production value right now. Yeah, except but how, how come you're in this brightly lit, happy office and I'm down in a hole? How did that work? The lightning is a reflection of our mutual cynicism or lack thereof. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Excellent. I'm a dark. I'm, a, I'm in a dark place right now. I'm in a very yeah, dark. Yeah. So you've place. got sort of a brooding, a brooding <laughs> look on the the past, present, and future of media, and then we'll pick your brain about that. Um, Emma, you, whenever I talk to you, you bring me out of my dark place. So we'll see <laughs> if that, that happens. That's why I was hired. Hundred <laughs> percent. Um, to, to kick it off, just to be a bit silly, do you have a show and tell item for us, perhaps, David? I do. I think a lot of people associate the Taiyi with the fish. This is what I associate the Taiyi with and always have. It's a paper airplane made out of a picture of blue sky. Nice. It was uh, actually made by an artist friend of mine and given to me. And it has sat on my desk from the very first day that the Taiyi was made. So really that is what the Taiyi is. It's a piece of blue sky made into a paper airplane and then just flung into the air to see what would happen. Nice. So it's a it's a hopeful and precarious metaphor is what I'm right. getting there. Yes. Okay. Yes. I like and that. I like that, as you know. Excellent. So <laughs> so for our three things, let's jump in, jump into the the hopeful and precarious evolution of the Taiyi. If you're gonna go back to 2003, could you paint mm -hmm. a bit of a landscape of what the media landscape was? What were where were you at and where mm -hmm. where was the Taiyi at when it was founded? Well, I had just worked in my second large corporate newsroom. I also worked at the San Francisco Examiner for a year, but I'd spent three years at the Sun, and it was tremendous for the, the quality of journalists who worked there. However, it was a very, a very conservative and pro-business newspaper, and it was quite slanted in its opinion pages and some of the restraints that it put on reporting. Very beholden to conservative advertisers. And um, also it, it had become emblematic of what was happening in media as a whole, which was a few super large corporations gobbling up the others. And at that time, that was a company called Can West and they owned most of the media in, in uh, BC, they had TV as well as newspapers. And they were also $3 billion in debt to pay for it all. And to me, it, it seemed like a really bad model for how to have diverse discussions within democracy, which is what I think media does. And then 9-11 hit while I was there. And, and the Sun's response to that was to become more conservative. We parted ways uh, several months after 9-11 in the spring, or actually, no, I'm sorry, at the end of the, the year. And my instinct was to be in this hole in this dark place, well, but so um, is working. right. But but then I thought to myself, I'm, I'm I have an excellent critique of what's wrong with corporate media, and that's exactly what journalists do. They critique everything and they make you feel really bad and depressed about everything, and then they say, "My work is done here." And I thought, well, maybe if we tried to create a model of what there could be instead, at least we'd have something to point to and talk about. 
as a solution ongoing, you know, uh, an early experimental solution to this problem of super concentrated ad driven conservative media. So from that sort of line of thinking, you are not only thinking about what other kind of project could I have, which turns into the tie, but you were thinking about how can media and journalism be different in terms of a more of a future focused solutions lens. Uh, could you talk a little more specifically about solutions journalism so people can wrap their head around the difference between that and sort of traditional journalism? Sure. So, you know, I became a journalist um, because I'm interested in reporting and investigating and telling stories, sharing facts that then get poured into the wider democratic conversation. Um, I don't really call myself an activist at all. And uh, I think there's a role for journalists to do what I just said. But as I said, often all we do is we tend to look back and say what went wrong yesterday and who's to blame, which is important work to be done in a democracy. But we need to ask more often what could go right tomorrow and who is showing the way. Um, that's the kind of journalism that I've had a lot of success with over the years. And it seems to lift people's spirits and help people have a discussion about what to streak for instead of what to look backwards at and say, we really messed that up. So um, I had done some of that sort of accidentally over the years, but right around the time that um, we started the TAI, I felt like, well, this might be a really neat platform to uh, kind of a workshop, you know, a little incubator to explore what could be done with, with solutions focused journalism. So I was a little, I was sort of early on this. There were many other people talking in similar terms. I'm not claiming to have thought it all up myself, but I was fairly early on it, yeah. So we've got actually a question here, and I forgot to say off the stop that we are live streaming, both of David and I are on unceded territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish First Nations. We've got questions coming in from all over. Uh, and one of them is, how can we encourage people to converse about actual issues as opposed to what the sort of more mainstream media is suggesting we get upset about, actual problems and actual needs of communities? What right. Thoughts on that? Well, I'm gonna, I mean, we're supposed to talk about three things, but it, I think pretty much I'm talking about two and one solutions journalism because <laughs> I like it so much. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to divide readers or not a media audience into issues they care about, places they live. But another way to, to group people is by sensibility. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people who want to get the bastards. I get that, you know, when I'm in my dark place, <laughs> I feel that, you know, but I think there's a, a broader sensibility of, okay, fine, I get it. How do we make things better? And um, a lot of a lot of what journalists like to call substantive journalism on the on the internet makes you feel bad, makes you feel disempowered, and that might be why people turn to more frivolous or fun or upbeat things to read and, and consume. Right? right. I think future focused solutions focused journalism invites everybody in because what you're saying is this is something that seems to be working at a small level here. I wonder if we can scale it up. Or this is something that's working somewhere else. I wonder if we could borrow that. Or I've been living an experiment lately myself, like the 100 mile diet, which we launched on the Tai. What would it be like to live on just local food? We'd find out a lot about how strong our local economy, food economy is. And we could tell the story of energy embedded in food. So my, my point is by telling, by, by addressing issues uh, coming at it from we all know it's a problem. What can we do about it? And then doing journalism about it, actually investigating these solutions as opposed to spinning them from a one, you know, and this is what I think is the role of the at-large journalist is to with good faith investigate these potential solutions. So this is a long answer to the question, but this won't surprise Emma. Nope. Um, I think the way to get, stream, I, hopefully the way to get people to shift away from frivolous, meaningless stuff on the web to more substantive stuff is to borrow some of the mood from this other stuff. Be more upbeat, be more positive, be more can do. And then start at the community level. 
you know, really make yourself of humble service to the community. What's the problem that you identify? Who in your community are already working on solutions? And, and basically collect that information and then reflect that mirror back to the community because then you empower the community to have a discussion, an informed discussion about how to solve those problems, right? To me, that's so exciting. Sense. Well, what I've seen with the pieces over the years that worked for me, that they were those kinds of pieces because people would run with them and talk about them. Right? If you bum them out, they just, you know, they roll their eyes and they move on. Well, and I think that builds on what Ala and Moira have said in previous live streams in terms of the role of the journalist sort of evolving into less of an expert and more of a servant, which I heard you use that right. word. And also consulting people more at the grassroots as the experts yeah. is a trend as well. So. All of those are trends in journalism that journalism that contributes to a more solutions focus. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to reiterate the thing that you said: the three things about solutions journalism: living the solution, talking about it, um, looking at a prototype, sort of looking and and see what's working about it, and then seeing where the solution is elsewhere. Just for folks, I think that's really the key thing to look uh, look for. Now. In the early days, 2003, can you give us a flavor of what was happening? This is before Well, Facebook. yeah, I mean, the, the TAI was actually sort of a solutions journalism project, right? Because I, I told you what I saw that was the problem. If you walked into the Vancouver Sun newsroom in 1999 when I was, or 2000 when I was the, the features editor there, brilliant reporters in that room. But very few people of color. And there were people making loud uh, jokes at the expense of LGBTQ people. That was okay in that newsroom at that time. It really shows you how insular that newsroom had become. And we lived in this incredibly diverse city and yet this newsroom did not reflect that. So that was a problem is that, is that there wasn't much diversity within the newsroom and that corporation was busily buying up all the media and replicating that model. So to me, I saw a strangling of, of the conversation that we needed to have in, built into the model. But what you had in 2003 is you had, you had, I mean, to me, the internet seemed kind of old because a pal of mine, David Talbot, started up salon.com in 1996 or something and I was writing for them and so like this the, the internet had been doing you know been percolating along for seven years I thought it was a pretty much had maxed out <laughs> I'm glad you didn't put money on that yeah and but but then I thought well you know I mean you avoid a lot of the reasons that that can west is so capital intensive you know with the bricks and mortar buildings and the and the peering presses and the trucks and the so I said, well, you know, this internet thing, you know, it's a way to do it in inexpensively. But you got to remember in 2003, there was no Facebook. There was no Huffington Post. There was certainly no Twitter. There were not mobile devices, right? There wasn't, there wasn't uh, the Some idea. Some people of still had pagers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there was a debate going on back then about whether Google was really that much better than Alta Vista. For as a search engine, you know, and I'm we're sure I bet on Alta any Vista. Gen Z folks going. that we've got here on the live stream, <laughs> we're just alienating. They're they're back on TikTok. It's not working out. These references. Exactly. Well, go back, get out your way back machine and punch some of these things in. So you can imagine this is how brilliant I was at start helping to start up an internet publication. I named it the Taiyi. Now, the only way people could find us at that time is they had to type the name of the TIE into their URL bar pretty much to find it. And so I'd go on the radio and they'd say, so you're with the TIE, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd say, uh-huh, this is not going to get us one viewer, right? Um, so it was in the early days, we really were not, we had no idea what we were, what we were getting into. And that one thing that was lacking was there was no open source software. So you had to build these rickety content management systems. It would be like me saying, Emma, would you like me to build you a bike? And you say, sure. And I'd say, great, I'll get the blacksmith 
fires going. You know, let me mine some ore and we'll get going. I mean, it was ridiculous, right? And right. Uh, it was only in like 2005 that we, we were able to sort of put together a decent website. So for a year and a half, it was pretty rickety. So a um, I remember the first DIY feel in the early days. And what other oh my... kind of moments were you having in the early days that were unique and it would give people perspective on what was happening? Well, I remember how how naive I was about now that we if we opened up this wonderful forum, all the good people would come online and help us out with their thoughtful insights. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so you know, I remember talking to the guy who designed the site and he's like, so you want kind of like a comment section, sort of like blogs have some of them? I go, yeah, one of those. So he just tacked the sun. Anybody could come and say anything they wanted and we had no way to stop them. <laughs> so fairly early on, this nice group of people had shown up and formed their own community. And then one day this raging anti-Semite showed up and began just saying the worst things. And I realized I had no way to stop him. I forgot to put in an emergency break. <laughs> so the only thing I could do is sit there and every time he made a comment was immediately deleted. Well, like, you're go on for and... Twitter now. <laughs> and yeah, and so I sat there with a bottle of whiskey for the next 13 hours. And that sucker and I dueled, man. He would put up an anti-Semite comment, I would delete it. He put up another, I would delete it. He finally went away. But it was that, you know, it was just very wild west back then. and. Um, we didn't really, you know, I don't think we knew we anyone was even noticing until um, Michael Buble or someone who said he was Michael Buble, sure sounded like Michael Buble, until Michael Buble called one day. Why? <laughs> what? <laughs> so this was early days and I, I came in and I checked the answering voicemail, might have been an answering machine. And it was some very angry person identifying himself as Michael Buble, and he wanted to fight. He wanted to come down and fight us physically. In particular, this freelancer who'd written a culture piece for us saying that he thought Morrissey was a better crooner than Michael Buble. Scandalous. I didn't see that as being the big blow up piece that we were going to, you know. But he can't, but Buble. So I thought, okay, this is good. You know, so I called Mark Machette, the guy who wrote it. And I said, you're going to make us famous. You and Michael Buble are going to go out in the alley. You're going to go around or two. I'll pay for whatever medical expenses accrue. And we'll, we'll be famous. And he chickened out. Mark, wherever you are, you chickened out. And you put us back 10 years. Okay. So... <laughs> Picking fights with Michael Buble and drinking booze and delay, deleting terrible comments. <laughs> early early strategies, so we'll save that for your how-to book. A uh, question that sort of brings up to present from the audience is, um, do MPs read and like this solution style of journalism without breaching confident confidentiality? Do you know how many MPs subscribers the TIE has? MPs. I know that... Uh... I couldn't tell you the number of members of parliament. I know that um, the premier reads the Tai. I know that for sure because um, he was in an airport. He was in YVR, and one of the workers there got into a conversation with him, and he said, "Oh, you're the one who was in the Tai about how we should protect your wages," and. Uh, she said, yeah. And he said, yeah, we're going to do that. So yeah, that's just, you know, just, just an average day at the Taiyi, you know, the premier, you know. But I, basically our readers, the way we can track them is um, through IP addresses. And a ton of their IP, we don't know exactly who they are, but we see that the kinds of places that their IP addresses emanate from and there are a lot in federal and provincial government. So you could imagine deputy ministers and aides and, you know, we are also clipped and distributed to the, um, to the legislative uh, bodies. Um, so, and that is how the TAI was designed. We had to, early on, we had to figure out the fact that we didn't have a lot of resources 
So we could have gone very uh, kind of more mass audience oriented, maybe gone a little more like Vice, a little looser, a little, a little younger in our in our conscious approach. But we figured with the with the small resources we had, we really wanted influential people who could make decisions that had a big effect on change. We wanted them to not be able to ignore and explain away the tie. And that has seemed to work. We, and we have a lot of academics who read us, a lot of activists, a lot of uh, policymakers, scientists. We skew a little. Michael more Buble reading. reads us. I mean, what do you want? You know, all the influentials. <laughs> so bringing us up to present, day. I'll just list a few of the solutions pieces that you sort of mentioned, and maybe we can share the links. Um, but there was Good to Grow, which was a solution series piece about sustainable, um, uh, sustainable food and growing local food, urban gardens. Um, there was No Fairs by David Olson and The Housing Fix. So those are three sort of big sort of solution series that, that mm. featured on the TAI in the past. Where do you sort of see the solutions journalism um, energy now on the tie? It's just sort of woven into our fabric. Like I doubt we would tackle a major issue if we didn't ask ourselves, okay, but then what? What are some some ways we could point towards solutions? Uh, so, for example, with the housing crisis, the tie was early to that, very early to that, um, and. We ended up producing hundreds of stories and you can find them all if you are a housing affordability geek. You can find them all at a place called The Fix, Housing Fix, I guess it's called, Housing Fix. Uh, it's, we made a microsite to store them all because there's so many. Uh, and a lot of these ideas, which again, they, we don't think them up in the newsroom and throw them out there. We're not spin doctors ourselves. What we do is we, we find the experts and we find the experiments that are happening. So we did that with affordable housing. And it took us everywhere from, from uh, Toronto to Burnaby to, to Vienna, you know. Um, and um, many, many, many of these tweaks, these, these policies, these ways of making housing more affordable have been taken up here in BC and in, and elsewhere. And, you know, maybe we were part of that, maybe we weren't. I have to think we were at some level because we packaged up these ideas so clearly and put them out on the internet, which is a powerful thing. And then people shared them and voila, some of them got incorporated, right? People found them on Alta Vista. Yeah, on Alta Vista. Shared them via fax. <laughs> we're doing it. So well, that's a great point. Oh, sorry, you I cut you off. No, I was going to say, so we that was in the last sort of eight years or so. So we just continued to do it. I mean, you cited three of what I would say are probably, we've done thousands of, of solutions, series and pieces. Um, we just celebrated the 15th anniversary of the 100 mile diet. Um, we did We did a very influential solutions piece leading into the Alberta, election that elected uh, Rachel Notley, we sent Mitch Anderson to Norway. And we said, Norway's got oil, Alberta's got oil. How come all the Norwegians are millionaires and Albertans can't pay bus drivers? Is there a solution that Alberta might wanna look into? And so he went there and he, and he talked to folks and, he, and, and what was clear is that they had negotiated much stricter royalty agreements early on. They had bought into their oil industry and nationalized it in a way that Trudeau was excoriated for doing the first Trudeau. Um, so there, you know, there were some concrete things there. And I remember that Notley did make that one of her election um, messages, which is we're not getting our fair share, which is different than being anti-fossil fuels, right? So those are all examples of sort of people making changes in possibly in response to some of the information that, that we're putting out there. There's a question coming in uh, from Facebook that says, David, what kind of advice do you have for journalists looking to start their own publications? And you're not allowed <laughs> to say don't. <laughs> well, I mentioned the whiskey. Yeah, I know. That um, 
No, I, th I actually think this is a fantastic time. I'm, a, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, even though I'm in my dark place here. <laughs> I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic about this. And so much has happened since we started. Um, social media changed everything. Uh, the Thai didn't need to have this big legacy brand. It didn't have to have uh, newspapers lying around for anybody to say, oh yeah, maybe I should go look at their website, which is the world we lived in in 2003. And social media is fantastic at finding niche audiences. It, 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 it just relentlessly, you know, kind of clarifies communities and allows them to, to find to be spoken to in ways they want to be spoken to and to be engaged. So my first bit of advice would be not be too general. Don't make it about everything. Figure out uh, your way into a particular group. There's an old saying that if you can get a thousand people to love you, then you'll be fine. Because the, if you can get a thousand people to give you $5 a month, you're, you're gonna be okay, you know? Um, so think about who are your thousand, you know? Um, that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, um, you know, look beyond yourself. For me, you know, I had this crazy idea. If nobody came and helped out and wanted to be part of it, people like the wonderful Michelle Hoare, who was our first business manager, and then all the fantastic people we have now there would be no tie at all whatsoever. So think in terms of you're not creating a publication, you're assembling a community of creative, committed people. So come up with something that people would want, that would wanna come your way and help you with based on their values and their passions. So this, is, this goes completely counter to what you might be advised in business school, which is find a market that needs a fratistat and make the cheapest stratostat. Well, the problem with that is nobody's excited by being part of that enterprise. You know? If I told you, Emma, we're gonna, at the Tai, we're gonna make the, the, you know, the best memes about muscle cars. I don't have a license, and, I don't care. You know, it's just not gonna fire you up. You know what I mean? Like, whatever, you know? So I just, to me, that's it. That's why the Tai has happened. Um, the big advantage you have when you do your own publication over other passion projects is it's up on the web and people can see it and think about it and decide whether they want to be part of it in their own real time. You don't even know that's going on until Emma Cooper shows up one day and says, I'd like to be part of this. Right. And then you say, great. Wow. You know, so if you were starting up a food delivery, you know, uh, business, You'd have to go around and tap people on the shoulder and say, somebody told me I should talk to you and maybe you want to be part of that. Um, so I just think it's like the tools are there now. The internet is just probably too, too exciting at the moment. <laughs> um, and um, the conversation, the democratic conversation is not gonna go out of vogue. People are not gonna get tired of talking about and discerning and, and streaking for change. So go for it, I say. That's lovely advice. And I, I think it kind of dovetails a little bit with the, the business model. I just, I think that what you talk about following passion and getting people on the bus that wanna be there and are excited, the audience as the person who calls and chats with the people who give to the Thai, mm. every conversation starts with, I'm sorry, I'm not giving enough. And the piece, <laughs> these people have been giving since 2013 right. and they're the best. Right. Everyone is just so on board for the cause and right. a membership model really allows kind of for that, that community investment, mm -hmm. like people want to give to things that they care about. And we're also so lucky to have the stewards and Eric and Christina um, yes. that also see that vision, you know? Right, well that, you know, hmm. So here's, a, here's some pragmatic advice about starting up your own publication. Here's a couple of things that worked out really well for me. My partner is a tenured professor. So I get to do things that are kind of risky financially and we don't yeah, get booted out of our house. So 
yeah, you have to attend to that reality. And then secondly, we were just completely blessed twice. First with our first investors, the folks at Working Enterprises, uh, which was a labor affiliated um, uh, uh, fund, investment fund. They stepped away a few years, uh, about two years ago and Eric Peterson who'd been, um, who'd been helping and Christina Monk, they, who are partners, they stepped forward and said, let us be the stewards of the Tai. It's just unbelievable what a difference that makes. Because when you have a bedrock of support, financial support, which they provide, a guaranteed bedrock, you can grow, you can, you can, you can do exciting things and grow. If every dollar you get in just kind of pays to keep the lights on, you can't, can't, right? So I guess maybe that's a bit of advice, which is um, don't, don't set yourself up to eat yourself alive, right? Try to figure out either how to do it really inexpensively, which is how we did it at the beginning, or um, some people with some dough that, could, that might come your way, you know, might want to be part of your passion project. Um, but yeah, we're very fortunate to have Eric and Christina. Definitely. And two quick questions. We're just slightly over time. So one- How did uh, that happen? It was, that was my fault. I let you go on. Uh, <laughs> David, why do you think the most major media outlets do not cover potential solutions in an in-depth investigative way other than running the occasional feel-good fluffy feature? You know, when I was in those big corporate newsrooms, there was a culture there. And I think I think the journalists own that culture to a certain degree. And I think it was sort of encouraged because it was convenient to encourage it by managers. And it was a, what I would call an anti-intellectualist culture. Um, I actually have a pointy head. I am a pointy headed intellectual. Well, I'm not an intellectual, but I, I like intellectuals. I have time for intellectuals, right? It used to be a bad thing in a newsroom to seem to use words that were too big or you know think abstract thoughts out loud. Um, also, it was an understood culture. We just point out the problems. Then the politicians solve them. That's a very crude diagram. That really does not acknowledge how things actually work. The media is embedded in a, a very complex ecosystem of change. And it's either beaming status quo messages that serve certain entrenched interests or it's positing change. And that, that decision was pretty much just avoided in the newsrooms that I was in. They were just sort of business as usual, literally every day. I think the other problem is that um, uh, journalists hear that idea of solutions focus and they think it's presumptuous and that it's activist and hopefully I've explained, no, you're, you're a humble investigator of experiments that are already underway. I was in Europe in 1990, looking at this weird concept that people were just starting to talk about called harm reduction for drug users. And I was looking at it in Liverpool where they were prescribing heroin. And I was looking at it in Holland where they were doing needle exchanges and, um, and providing safe injection sites. 1990, and I wrote that up and ended up uh, running in Mother Jones. And that was our future happening back then. But I did it as a reporter. And I, then I went to Compton, which is a, a, a neighborhood in Los Angeles that is, was hard hit because the tire manufacturer had left and it's a predominantly black community. And they were struggling with uh, high issues of drug addiction, but also alcoholism. And they were not thrilled with the idea of legalizing drugs or even encouraging, making it easier to use drugs. And uh, they said that there were some serious structural economic issues and issues of social justice that had to be dealt with first before you start making it easier to use drugs here, which was a super important message. And that's what a journalist does. They take back this experiment that's happening somewhere else and they talk to all the people on the ground where it might be implemented next and they find out the obstacles as well as what's promising. 
that is not being an activist or a spin doctor, right? One more quick, well, two more quick questions. Now it's on me that it's over and you cannot be- I've got that. nothing to do. I'm down here in my hole. Concise. I had lunch, <laughs> somebody slipped lunch under the door in my hole. Oh, okay. I'm fine. <laughs> Um, could you name a couple other Thai-esque media outlets in Canada? Uh, sure. I mean, um, I mean, a lot of people will know about the National Observer. Um, they're, I think they're a little more focused generally on fossil fuels and, and the environment. Um, I mean, actually we have a fascinating ecosystem in BC. I think BC should be studied by the rest of the world. And someone should write a solutions journalism piece about fixing media and what's going on in BC because we have a really interesting publication here called the Narwhal. Again, very focused on the environment pretty much. And so this is this niche thing I'm talking about. They just do pretty much one thing. They write about the BC environment um, and they do it beautifully and well. Um, and they are member supported. I mean, that's the other huge change that happened over the years is that the advertising market has been destroyed by Facebook and Google. And so now people are realizing that they need to pay a little money to keep their media organizations afloat. And it's not their fault they didn't before. It's, it's, they thought it was free because advertising paid for everything. There was a price for that. Advertisers called the tune. So, I've just named two membership model publications, National Observer, the Narwhal. Um, Halifax Examiner is one that I've heard about recently. So what's that? So the Halifax Examiner? Exactly, right, very much so. And again, their niche is uh, quite geographic, you know? No one else is gonna cover us with the kind of depth that we deserve, mm -hmm. right? So we're gonna do it. We're your, we're your we stick up for for this part of the world, right? Which it goes, I think, the imagination that the Thai has for itself. We are BC. Um, the walrus, we're often compared to the walrus. Where we differ quite a bit is that the walrus depends quite a bit on another game that a lot of uh, new journalism outlets are trying. New, I mean, the walrus was started when we were they do a lot of corporate sponsorships. They do a lot of, uh, I personally, I consider that to be the, the close cousin of, of corporate advertising. We don't do that. So we're sort of like them and that we love long form in-depth journalism and the beautiful art and presentation, but we made a, we made a specific decision to not do corporate sponsorships than they do. But you know, it takes, it takes all these different models. I'm fine with a diversity of models paying for journalism. The Thai wasn't started to say, this is the one way you should do it. I just felt like if you had 20 different models for paying for journalism, you would definitely get diverse content. Whereas if you have one model, you're gonna get one kind of content. And that's a good point. Final question, I promise. Is finding joy and comic relief in your personal uh, life difficult with a vocation that focuses on exposing social problems and reporting on negative topics? Last question. It should be difficult. It really should, you know? I mean, and I, there's something kind of wrong with me because I, I'm just, I'm a bit of a smart aleck. And Emma would be able to tell you that I, I'm, I'm sort of inappropriate in shifting the mood towards some ridiculous, ironic observation. I think it's a defense mechanism for exactly what you're talking about. I have to keep a kind of level of absurdist irony about me. Um, you know, as a, as, a, as a kind of a serious young teenager, it was Monty Python and then the talking heads and, you know, that saved me, right? Just to know that you could be critical but also joking and laughing and savoring the absurdity of human existence as well as the fact that we, we do have to get some stuff done together here too. We have to make some positive change. So um, I don't know, people have called me and I, you know, kind of a 
ironic idealist or a smart alecky cynic or what I, I don't know but I'm with some kind of mix um, the reason I think it's kind of, there's something kind of wrong with me is that I it, it's a blind spot and some of my colleagues who are very sincere I think that I make the mistake of asking them to keep going into the breach and doing these really tough stories and sometimes I forget that I'm bumming them out <laughs> so if there are any tie writers out there hearing this you have permission to go watch all the Monty P Python DVDs. Or just tell me, Dave, you're bumming me out. I want to do a fun story now. Permission granted. I like that. Well, <laughs> and I always... just got to say, I do will say this. Emma, you are super fun to work with, but there is a general sense of humor at the Taiyi. We have really funny, smart folks. I mean, Robin Smith cracks me up all the time. She's the editor in chief. Um, but everyone, every, I mean, look at Chris Chung, you know, just look at his art and his writing. Uh, Ala Alanian is just constantly making wisecracks that are funny. Um, you know, we have like a, we have, we're on Slack, like a lot of virtual organizations are. And some of our entire channels are just given over to joking around and bullshitting, right? Because you have to just to keep your sanity. Joking and bullshitting. I think that's what the note we're going to end. This oh, no. On. <laughs> no, that's perfect. As that a, wasn't what I wanted to leave people. 100% on board with this. <laughs> I think that's it. You got to go hard to the truth and to the solutions and to what's working. And then you got to step back and do whatever you can to take care of yourself. It's not a bad message to leave on. Perfect. Thank you much so better. much, David. <laughs> um, again, next week, we're going to have a chat with Jeff Dimbicki, who's our climate reporter. He's in New York City. He's going to give us a little bit of an update on what's happening there. So tune in next week at 1 p.m. Thank you again to David. And thank you to watch and for watching. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>